I rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, as I do on the internet. I speak my mind. I'm very open. I say things that many people, uh, you know, perhaps in the Midwest don't appreciate, you know, along the Bible Belt. But that's me, and I can't mask my personality. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from TheKnifeJunkie.com. Welcome, everyone, to today's podcast, which is brought to you by QuickBooks Self-Employed. And if you're like many of our listeners, a contractor, a freelancer, or any kind of self-employed work, you'll want to go to TheKnifeJunkie.com slash QB30 and get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, 30 days for free. Just go to TheKnifeJunkie.com slash QB30. And Bob, we're not going to do too much yakking around uh, on our uh, opening of the show today because we've got a great interview that we want to get to. That's right, Jim. Today we're speaking with Jim Skelton, and uh, we get into all sorts of topics from his uh, his amazing collection and his thorough and uh, pretty uh, outstanding video reviews to his knife making career that he has uh, gone one hundred percent into and is just killing it. Mm. Fascinating interview, and I hope you'll stay tuned and listen to that. And that's coming up next. Follow the Knife Junkie on Instagram at the knifejunkie.com slash Instagram. Today I'm speaking with Jim Skelton. You may know Jim Skelton from his amazing YouTube uh, review videos and his outstanding collection of high-end pocket knives. But Jim has recently pivoted into the world of knife making, and he has gone in 100%. I'm a great admirer of his work and uh, a great admirer of he himself. Jim Skelton, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Thank you very much for having me. I'm doing great. So it's a brisk, cool morning here in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. So let me, uh, without getting too personal, let me ask you uh, just to break the ice. What's in your pocket today? What are you carrying? Uh, actually, I'm carrying nothing because, uh, unfortunate for me, I misread all of your emails and didn't notice the Eastern Standard Time. I'm an hour behind you and uh, actually literally just rolled out of bed, which explains my sexy, raspy morning voice. But if I were to have gotten up a little bit earlier, um, uh, it probably would have been my Rockstead shin today because I have a little bit of work I need to do. And I can always rely on that one to cut pretty much anything always. Okay, so that's that's something that uh, I and maybe others find uh, unbelievable, but so cool. You have this collection of uh, extremely gorgeous and high-end knives, uh, knives coveted by by many folks, especially, I mean, you mentioned the Rockstead. Those are just dazzling to look at, but you use them. You carry them and you use them. You don't baby them. Why is that? I mean, how can you use a Rockstead? Isn't that just to be looked at and fondled? You know, I think it's like anything else. You know, if you... What makes a common man sick when they look at uh, something that that they covet or they're looking up to, they aspire to, and, you know, they see a guy at a gas station with a, with a Ferrari and you're like, man, I would, I would kill to have that car. That's amazing. What's it like to drive it? And the guy looks at you and goes, I only drive it like 800 miles a year. That's it because I want to keep the value up and my insurance dictates uh, I can only drive it so many miles and this and that because they really only bought it to resell it. They only bought it to hold its value. And, I've never really looked at knives like that. I like to be able to, you know, get a knife that if at some point I decide I want something different, then I can flip it, I can trade it, I can sell it, and it holds its value or it appreciates in value. But that's more about buying the right item from the right maker or manufacturer at the right time at the right price. It's less about my enjoyment of it. If, like my Rockstead, I've had that shin for over six years now. And for me, the greatest pleasure of owning that particular knife is cutting with it. It's a unique cutting experience because of the way as as unbelievably sharp as they are. The fact they stay sharp longer than most anything else. The fact that it's, I think it's the only convex ground blade that I have, to be honest with you. And it just, it's a, it's a different feeling when I cut with it. And I really enjoy that. I don't know. I've never really babied anything. I'm, I'm big into cars. I'm big into motorcycles and guns. And, and there are things that on all those levels, I tend to buy the best that I can afford uh, across any of those given spectrums. I, I don't baby my cars. They're, they're daily driven. Uh, my motorcycles, I ride them hard. I don't really worry about resale value. You want to have resale value if possible. It is something it's okay to want that. 
but don't hinder yourself and the enjoyment of whatever that hobby is by always worrying and stressing over, well, if I use it, it's going to be worth less. You bought it to enjoy it. You bought it because you liked it. If you're buying it only for investment, leave that thing wrapped up and stick it in a, in, a, in a safe somewhere and then don't touch it, you know, but other than that, enjoy it. It's about the past being the past, the future not happening, and you're living right now. And if you have a Rockstead in your pocket, why not be using it? Exactly. And, and one, one thing to add to that, because I, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of different groups and see a lot of different types of individual personalities come out in this hobby. And I see a lot of people that will... Uh, really lay into people for owning nice things and not using them. Like they don't go out and baton their, their $3,000, you know, custom Robert Carter. Hmm. Everybody gets a, gets enjoyment from different ways of collecting. There are some guys that will just use everything they own. That's great for them. Mm -hmm. There are some guys that will literally buy a knife because they want to look, treat it like a piece of art. They just want to look at it. They want to maybe every now and then, take it out of the case and fondle it and touch it and then wipe it down and put it back. That doesn't lessen their enjoyment. That was why they bought it. That's how they enjoy it. And nobody should really be giving anybody else hell for how they enjoy it. And I know that's not where your question was going at all, but it just reminded me that I see that so often. And, you know, people start threads on on Facebook groups and, you know, I use my knife and, and they're talking down to anybody else that doesn't beat their knife to shit. Listen, you know, I I own, I've always owned, well, I can't say always, eh, for the past 15 years, I've owned nice cars. Mm -hmm. Now, just because I don't choose to do a demolition derby in my car doesn't mean I don't use it because I don't leave it out in a hailstorm. Doesn't mean that uh, I baby it. I take care of my things, my knives. I break, I break them down. I clean them. I take care of them. I use EDCI on them because I don't want them to rust. I strop them. There are things that I do. That sure, uh, they may look newer longer because that's the enjoyment that I get. I bought a beautiful object. It may have a practical use, but I still enjoy it for its beauty. I'm not going to go out and, and chop wood with a $3,000 custom folder. I'm going to buy a knife specifically made to do a certain task. Well, to, to that end, I, I really relate to that because um, my my knife collection is, um, well, I've, I'm, I'm going through a, a phase right now where I'd like to sell some off. And I think everyone goes through this. I, I went through this uh, originally with Hinderer knives. I love Hinderer designs. I had all these ZTs and I was like, why don't I just sell the ZTs and get a real Hinderer? And then that kind of uh, launched me into a slightly higher strata of my oh, collecting. Yeah. Uh, but oftentimes um, I'll buy a knife like uh, Boker is good at this. If you can't uh, afford a Charles Marlowe knife but you want to have a design of his that you can pick up fondle and also use without worrying about it because it's a $120 boker. I have a lot of knives like that in my collection because uh, for the foreseeable future, I'm not going to have a JB Stout folder. I, you know, I have two young kids and I got other expenses, but I love the designs. And it's one thing to look at a design and uh, to drool over it online, but to actually have one and to be able to hold it and manipulate it, if, even if you're not using it, even if it doesn't even feel good, yeah. uh, there is some value to that. It's like it's like owning a painting that you just look at and appreciate. Exactly. That, that's 100% correct. And we all go through those stages. You know, knife knives are, I don't want to say it's a unique hobby because it really does uh, bear a lot of resemblance to other collecting hobbies. But you d- generally don't, let's say you're, you're into watches, you generally don't jump off the deep end and go, uh, I'm going to buy an Audemars Piguet or I'm going to buy a Patek Philippe you're generally going to start with something a lot more affordable. And then you're going to buy multiples of different affordable things in order to see what your various tastes are. And then you're going to reach a wall at some point. You're going to go, I really appreciate the things that I've got. I really enjoy these, but I kind of want to make that step up because when I make that step up financially, I see there's a whole different world and there are other things that I can appreciate. And as you level up, you should really enjoy that. When you go from your production knives, your you know, 30, 40, $50 Kershaws and whatnot and cold steels up to maybe say the higher end, you know, bench maids and Microtex and whatnot. And then you step up there to mid techs and then to customs and then to art knives and things like that. Mm-hmm. Enjoy each level as you're experiencing it because there is a certain amount of joy that waiting for that package to arrive, experiencing maybe your very first uh, dual action automatic or your very first out the front 
that you're never going to recapture that. You know, it's like when you, you, you see people that are having children and you have children of your own, you always tell them, enjoy those little things as they happen because you can't go back and experience those first steps again and the first mm-hmm. words again. They only happen once. And that, that giddy feeling that you get really it becomes something, I don't want to say that you're jaded, but it becomes something that, that's customary. And once you've leveled up, once you go up into those higher levels, you don't fall back. You don't see somebody that's buying, you know, $80,000 Ken Steigerwalds going back and buying a, a Kershaw Blur. It <laughs> yeah. does not happen. So enjoy each of those levels as you're experiencing them and look forward to what the future is going to hold and, and set those goals for yourself. I see a lot of guys going, you know, I've got $82.60 in PayPal. What's available for sale? <laughs> Dude, save up a little bit more. Enjoy the things that you just got. Because you're that guy that just bought 13 knives this month and, you know, let that grow to $200 or $600 or whatnot and see what that next level is like and see what people are talking about. And, you know, hold it, uh, you know, I guess to, to put it in sexual terms, it's like edging. Hold yourself off as long as you can and get yourself to that edge and hold out as long as you can. And then when you can't, you can't take it anymore. Uh, blow your little load, blow that load of money that you've got saved up and get yourself something special that you're going to remember and go, you know, it's like my Rockstead. I remember vividly buying that my very first Rockstead over six years ago. It was a great experience opening that box and feeling it and seeing the finish quality and cutting with it. I went, wow, that's what it's all about. I think I may remember when you got your first Rockstead, too. I, I think you made a video about that. Yeah, I think the world may remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so so you have a past in watches. That is interesting to me because I find that most knife guys are also watch guys and pen guys and flashlight guys. I don't quite get the flashlight thing, but I get it. You oh, know, flashlights are amazing. I, I know. I know. I just haven't. I won't allow myself to reach that yet. Don't do it because once you do, you're going to realize here's an EDC item. Unlike my pistol, unlike my knives that I can literally use all the time. I can find a reason to pull this out and truly, really use it every single day. Oh, yeah. And then you're just going to want more and more and more. So um, watches, big yes. part of your past. You were on a TV show about watches. I, I'm kind of unclear about that. Could you <laughs> tell us about that and then how you got to high-end folding knives? Because I know that you took part in designing a knife, I mean, a watch, I know. And or maybe you designed the whole thing. Tell me about your your past in watches. Yeah, it was it was a weird thing. It was not something that I ever... Um, wanted to do it, it's 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 sort of parallels in in many ways uh, my knife career um i i had just become really interested in watches at a certain point in my life around uh 2000 2001 and i had heard about this one brand and, and people started i saw people collecting a lot of them and having a lot of different varied styles and because they were affordable but they looked more expensive than they were so i kind of got into those and got involved in a forum on the internet about it and became a moderator. And I was just going on this uh, little journey of uh, self-discovery and photography. I'm a, I'm a self-taught photographer. Uh, you know, fast forward now, I've, you know, obviously had magazine spreads and shot for billboards and major ad campaigns for big companies. But at that point, I was just kind of teaching myself and switching over from uh, film to digital media. Um, I had an old Nikon F F100. I used to shoot on film. I enjoyed it. And then learning digital photography was a, a quite a, a big step. And so I would photograph the watches that I would buy and I would write up these uh, text based reviews and people liked it. Well, the owner of this one particular watch brand saw it, loved it and said, hey, we have this uh, huge thing. We, we sell on television and you would be perfect for this. And literally the guy would not take no for an answer. I kept saying, no, I grew up in the film industry. My, my family worked in the film industry. Pretty much every major film, TV show and even commercials that were filmed in Florida uh, from 1970 on, my family was involved in. Like We were you know, involved with Miami Vice from the pilot to oh, cool. season six and I grew up on the sets of Miami Vice as a child thinking this art deco lifestyle was what everybody experienced. It was a very mind warping experience. So I knew that I didn't want to have anything to do with the, the, the public eye because you lose a bit of yourself to it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, basically they wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, I got offered a, a very lucrative job. It was a big step up for me at the time. And I moved to Minnesota. I took the job. I was there for six and a half years. 
And, you know, they put products in front of you and they say, sell this. And, you know, you had some say in what you got a chance to work with. And other times, you know, it's a job. It's a paycheck. You do mm-hmm. what you're told. I didn't particularly love all the brands that I represented, but it allowed me to do things and make some changes in that industry. Um, doing live television for that long, uh, for so many hours and in front of so many people, I gained more and more experience and became the, the top person in that field, at, at least uh, you know, sales numbers and viewership and whatnot. And I was able to do things like bring out Patek Philippe's and Jaeger LeCoultres and watches that had never been aired on television before. We were able to then all of a sudden get and it opened up that door. It was a very limited door, very limited shows we were able to do that with. But the, you know, the, the bread and butter, what paid my paycheck was this one uh, fairly inexpensive brand that is uh, somewhat controversial. So I don't really connect myself mm-hmm. with them at this point. So I don't really mention them all that often. New management came in and, and cleaned out a lot of the older hosts. They fired nine or ten hosts at one oh. point. Uh, when they first came in, I was lucky enough to stay there because my numbers were solid. But I rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, as I do on the Internet. I speak my mind. I'm very open. I say things that many people, uh, you know, perhaps in the Midwest don't appreciate, you know, on the Bible Belt. But that's me, and I can't mask my personality. So I clashed with the CEO and I was literally let go overnight. It it took 10 months for them to do it, I found out. Mm. Uh, But it was an overnight thing I wasn't expecting. But I had been very loyal to that company. I got a very nice severance package and I didn't have to work for a while. So that was nice. Went to another network and I was there for a few years before getting an offer to move here to Dallas, which allowed me to retire from television. Uh, I did enjoy what I was doing. Uh, I didn't enjoy that I couldn't walk through an airport or through a shopping mall or whatnot without being recognized, especially if my if I opened my mouth and people heard my voice. Right. Um, I love people. I don't like being around people. Um, so it's it's one of those weird things. I know I seem very extroverted, but I'm not really that person in real life. I'm I'm a very stay at home with my family in my own private space kind of person. That's how introverts tend to uh, tend to deal with the world is by being extroverted in uh, in controlled bursts. Yes, exactly. You can control that yourself. So um, during the time I was doing those live shows, we had this particular crystal material that we were trying to prove to the world was as scratch resistant as sapphire. So I had already uh, I was I had always loved knives. I always had really nice production knives and. Around 2009 is when I stepped into custom knives. So I would bring one of my knives onto the show and try to destroy the crystal live on the air with my blades. And oh, that's rich. People started noticing, hey, he's carrying a cool knife. What is that? Or I recognize that. And it kind of developed into this whole new thing. And I was welcomed into the custom knife community at that point. And uh, it literally took off from there. I don't participate in forums anymore like I did back then. <laughs> Uh, for reasons that many people don't participate in my forums and other forums. But it was a it was a fun experience learning from people in that community. So it it sounds like it it was a it was a natural fit and a natural yeah. evolution. So as a collector and user of these high end knives and custom knives, what attracts you to one super high end knife over another? What will get you to lay down what you consider serious money on one knife but not on another? The first thing, it's it's going to be like anything else. I mean, I don't care how many times somebody tells you that the, a Volvo is the safest car in the world. Um, they don't appeal to me visually. So it, I've got to fall in love with it. Um, there, are, there were a lot of women out there when I was single that had really great personalities and I'm sure would have made fine brides. Uh, but I was always attracted to a certain uh, aesthetic body style and uh, things like that. So it's it's first and foremost, it's going to come down to the aesthetics. Is it an interesting design? I'm a little more picky now. I want it to be a very unique design. I don't want to see, you know, another iteration of, you know, whatever hot popular thing is going on. Mm-hmm. Like right now, front flippers is the thing. I have one front flipper on the way to me right now. I despise front flippers. I do not like them. I own one because I like the knife otherwise. I have another one coming because they were able to do it. I'm not going to give a spoiler as to what it is yet, okay. but they have a way of doing it that was actually really easy to use. So I'm not a flavor of the month kind of person. I have been. I have fallen into that trap, the overbuilt knives and you know, things like that. And, you know, when Timascus really got big and Zirconium really got big and you know, all these things as they've happened. Sure, I, I've become attracted to the, the shiny new object in the corner, but I've gotten to the point now where I'm much more jaded. And I don't 
I don't make the money that I used to. TV money's gone, baby. All those days are long gone. So I'm very cautious about how I spend my money. So I don't generally go cheaper. Uh, I just buy less often, but I try to buy the best of what excites me. And, and it's going to be aesthetics for one. Number two, it's going to have to have some sort of functionality. I, I'm not at the level where I buy only art knives that I'm just going to look at. I, I do aspire to be at that level one day. I would love, I mentioned Ken Steigerwald earlier. There, there's there's an, a knife maker. I would love to own one of his knives. You are not going to carry that and do abusive things with it. I would carry it. That's me. I carry every knife I've ever owned, except for one. There's like one knife that I won't carry, but everything else, I at least want to be able to carry. It. And, but am I going to want to break down a box with uh, an $80,000 <laughs> uh, knife that has 300 individual pieces of hand laid mother of pearl and uh, crazy things? No, you have to be practical. So for me, it's going to have to be the aesthetics. It's going to have to have a practical use to some degree. And I really want it to be by a maker whom I respect. Now, I, there are there have absolutely been times that I have bought knives made by a maker that I didn't have a particular degree of respect for just because the knife was so amazing on its own. Mm-hmm. At that point, I will tend to, you know, you know who Sonny, uh, Sonny Barger is, right? Yes. Uh, Hell's Angels. He refused to give Harley Davidson money, but to be a Hell's Angel, you have to ride a Harley Davidson. So we're, there's a quandary there for him. I don't want to line Harley Davidson's pockets with money. So what do you do? He would buy used bikes. He would buy bikes from other people and buy parts from other people. So if there's a knife maker that I don't have a particular degree of respect for, I don't want to support them. And it's the, there's like two, honestly. Mm-hmm. Then I would buy that knife from a, a secondary source okay. and enjoy it privately on my own. Uh, because of what it is, because you know what, you may not like a particular knife maker, but if they're extremely talented, you can't take that away from them. You can, you have to separate the personality uh, or their work ethic, whatever it is. Maybe that you don't like the fact they've had your knife in for a spa treatment for two years, mm. won't answer your emails. That is bad business practice, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you know he's achieved certain things and he's done certain things that you admire people need to start separating that just a little bit. Yeah, I, I think people, makers of all sorts, uh, can fall into the romantic notion of the uh, of the secluded artist, you know, leave me alone while I generate my masterpiece. Well, you know what? There are people who generate masterpieces and answer emails at the same time. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I've noticed uh, in your more recent videos, your hands have changed. Now they're looking a little drier, a little rougher. And uh, I think that's because you're making knives now. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk a lot about that, actually. Uh, I had a recent conversation with Jeff Blauvelt, and uh, you came up in the conversation. Oh, I love Jeff. Awesome guy. And he mentioned uh, how you, from his perspective, you are going about knife making in exactly the right way. Uh, Tell me how you got into it. It's funny. uh, Jeff gave me my first taste of knife making. Uh, I had no interest whatsoever in ever making knives before or even after this particular incident. But uh, I had gone up to visit him one year around Christmas time. It was a Christmas. No, no, it was a a summer vacation we took. Anyway, went to go visit him. And uh, he's like, hey, man, let's film a video while you're here. This is back when he did a lot of YouTube videos. Um, You know, John Gray was there. uh, Sebastian was there organized now um it, vance was there we were all just kind of hanging out and having fun and he's like i want you to see what it's like to grind a knife so he, st- he steps me up to the to his grinder gives me a piece of steel and i start pushing into the platen. and it was my first experience feeling that and i'll be honest with you i, I handed the knife right to john gray afterwards i ground like maybe two-thirds of one side of the knife and went okay that's good enough for me and then john finished the knife i actually i still own that knife that was a very special thing for me to be there with Jeff and with John and their friends. So I, I still had that knife, but I never really had an interest in doing it. Um, it was only years later when Jerry Moen talked me into it uh, over and over, over the course of a year and a half saying, I think you can do this. I want to teach you how to make knives. And, you know, when you get that opportunity from someone, you know, he was a director in the Knife Makers Guild at the time and he's accomplished so much, you, you should take that opportunity if you can. And I, I didn't think it was ever going to happen. I never thought I'd see that transition. Uh, take place. I never thought my hands, like right now, I don't have feeling in any of my fingertips or my thumbs because of the work I was doing yesterday, which was all after cutting everything off the bar stock with the bandsaw, it was all shaping it on the grinder. 
and making finger choils and, and, and making sharpening choils and all these things. And I don't have feeling left in my fingers because of that particular activity. Uh, my, yeah, my hands have changed. They were, um, you know, again, I was on live TV for 11 years. You literally had to get manicures twice a week and things like that. And I went from never having had worked with my hands before my entire life of tools, wow. all 30 at that point, 32 years, 33 years, uh, sorry, 42, 43 years had fit into a handheld toolbox. That was all I had. A few wrenches, a couple pair of pliers. That was really it. Um, if God forbid I bought a piece of furniture from Ikea, I would have to go buy a tool to put it together. <laughs> you know, that was where I was. And now I have a shop full of tools. I have huge uh, rolling toolboxes. I have machines and things that, uh, you know, three years ago, I wouldn't have known how to operate or even turn on. And it's, it is a wild change and it's, it's a very satisfying change. You can never have too many tools. It doesn't matter if you're making things or not. That's one, one justification I always have. Uh, in spending money is yeah. tools. If it's a tool and, you know, knives happen to be tools. So that, that's a little gray area for me, of course. So it seems like um, from an observer's perspective, such as such as my own from uh, YouTube and but mostly from Instagram that you got very good very quickly. Your grinds are very clean. You have a you have several mo four or five models, I think, that you do. And they're all uh, seem impeccably built. Of course, I've never held one. Thank you. But I, I, I think I can. I think I'm a good enough judge in looking at them. They're gorgeous. And and, and I'm also uh, very impressed with your your handle making. Even before they're fixed to the knives, you will you will show yourself sometimes working on handles sure. or handles in progress and they're uh they seem like the work of someone who has worked with their hands. How did you get so good so fast? You know, it's I, I have to give full credit to the the people that have taken their time uh by teaching me Jerry by by showing me the basics. I had made uh, seven or eight knives uh, in his shop under his tutelage before buying my own equipment and opening my own shop. You know, the first, I would say the first two to three knives, he was there over my shoulder. And after that, it was kind of like he would check in on me or I could come to him with questions and he was uh, about doing his own things. But there were so many uh, valuable things that he taught me that laid the foundation. And I've been fortunate over my career of reviewing knives and, and being involved in the knife community that I've made friends with some very prolific knife makers. And, you know, if I get stuck on something, you know, I remember one time, my, the first time I glued up uh, a knife and I tried masking off the blade with uh, painter's tape and I won't go into the whole thing, but it turned into a horror show. And I ended up with a lot of things stuck to things that couldn't get unstuck. I didn't know what to do without damaging the finish of the knife. So I picked up the phone and I called Doc Schiffer. Huh. I've gotten painted into a corner with certain things and I could pick up the phone and call Todd Beck or drive down to his shop and, and ask questions and watch and learn. And I, I, I've had a benefit in a lot of ways that most people don't have. Number one, I had a name in this particular industry before becoming a knife maker. So I didn't have to struggle to sell every knife I've made. And I'm beyond thankful for that. And I do recognize that. I had friends that have been doing this for decades, that have seen it all, done it all, run into every problem that you could possibly imagine, that I can call and say, hey, I'm at this stage in my life, this finally happened, what do I do? And they're gracious enough to take time out of their day to help me. And I can't thank them enough because without them, I could not have grown to where I am right now. But aside from that, you know, there are, there are times when you're just alone, you know, it could be 10 o'clock at night and you're sitting out there in, in your shop and this knife isn't grinding right for some reason, or you can't get that edge to sharpen for some reason. And you know what, you're not going to call somebody at 10 o'clock at night and wake them up or disrupt their family life. You're going to figure it out on your own. Okay. So it's been a lot of practice. It's been a lot of knives getting thrown in the trash. These aren't folders I'm making the fixed blades. So if you make a mistake so tragic, uh, you throw the entire knife away, not just a component that you've goofed up on the knife. Right. So when I get to folders, it'd be a lot better. So if I misgrind a blade, I can replace the blade, not the entire knife that I've worked on for a week. So it's a lot of practice. And I tell people this all the time, practice, 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 learn, for, watch what made the mistake that you just made, learn how not to make the mistake again, but then sit there with that knife and learn how to fix that mistake. So it's not a trashed knife. And once you, most of knife making is learning, uh, learning around obstacles and learning around your mistakes. And if you learn from those mistakes, you identify them, you identify what you did to create that mistake, then you will continue to grow as a maker. 
And that's all I want to do. I just want to make every knife a little bit better than the last knife that I made. And if I'm able to constantly do that, then I'm making my customers happy. I'm growing uh, as an artist. I'm growing as, as a maker. And I won't limit myself. I, there won't be a ceiling for me as long as I try to keep learning. And when I spend time in other knife maker shops, I spend more time listening than talking. I want to soak in that knowledge. I want to, you know, breathe the air that they're breathing and hopefully a little bit will rub off on me. So, you know, I try to buy the best equipment that I can afford. I sold the vast majority of my knife collection. Hmm. Buy things. I have $10,000 tied up in just my grinder. Just my grinder alone, nice. because I, I know that's my most used piece of equipment. I'm going to rely on that for every knife that I ever make, and I don't want it to hinder me. I don't want there to be limitations based on a price point. So I bought the best that I could possibly get, and it's because of that grinder that does the things that it does, because of the platen that I use, I can flat grind and, and do these satin, velvety, smooth bevels. I also treat my belts like they're free. You know, when I go to finish a knife, if that final grit, let's say, is 800 grit, I will grind the left side with an 800 grit brand new fresh belt. When I go to the right side, I change to another brand new fresh belt. Hmm. And that gets that you know, those two or three final passes that way. That way, it's as perfect as I know how to make it. And that's why a lot of times I show I'll, I'll hold my knives in the shop directly under a work light. So you can see the reflection of the grinds. You can see the the rainbow that goes through the, the grinds. Because I want to show people I am putting in the work. Even a knife that I'll do a dark acid stone wash finish, mm. it's still going to be a 400, 600 grit knife all the way around. And I'll show that right before I dip it to show people I'm not masking up inferior work. I'm just doing a, a preferred finish. Right. Laying in the, the foundation because I am under a microscope and I realize that. And a lot of people have wanted me to fail. Oh, you oh, of course. I talk about knives on the internet. Now he thinks he could make knives. I want to see him fail. So <laughs> I document so much of what I do to the point of obsession because I want to show people I am working as hard as I can to respect the people that taught me. Because no matter how long I do this, uh, people that were around when I started will always remember that Jerry Mullen was the one that taught me and influenced me. People remember that I spent a lot of time in, in Todd Begg's shop and I'll be learning how to make folders from him and, and learn his techniques and, and hopefully do him justice. So I don't ever want somebody to look at my work poor as a poor reflection on the people that have taught me. Right, right. And and uh, the, the people who, well, the haters, for for lack of a better term, obviously you pay them no mind, but that's, that's the... Uh... That that happens when when you can't aspire to something yourself, and you just want to see other people fail. That's uh, exactly that's not something you can take seriously. So it's, it's a serious thing. There's, it's it's a uh, a mental disorder. It's a mental condition. Yeah, yeah. Get you, worry about yourself, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's all. Exactly. So you're talking about uh, when you were talking about uh, using a brand new belt for each side. It seems like symmetrical. Uh, getting something symmetrical. Uh, I've I have a a craftsman grinder, and uh, you know I've noodled around. Mm -hmm. in comparison to you or, or to serious knife makers. And the thing that I have found the most difficult is getting one side to be like the other side. Uh, and I know that has a lot to do with practice. Symmetry is very difficult to achieve. Oh my God. And, and I could see the, uh, I could see the um, temptation of deciding that you're just going to be a uh, chisel ground guy, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> because my left sides look so good. And then my right side, you know, and I guess it has to do with uh, my, my right hand dominance never sure. looks as good. Uh, I like your idea of of treating each belt as if it's brand new. But I, I wanted to ask you about your design inspirations and and what your design process looks like. Are you a, a draftsman? Are you a CAD guy? Or do you just pick up the steel and it speaks to you like a sculptor? How does that work? You know, I, I wish I could say that. I wish I had that in me to where you can look at a bar of steel and all you see is what's within it. No, I'm not like that. Uh, I sit down with a pen and paper. I don't know how to do CAD, uh, CAD CAM stuff. I, I don't, I don't understand it. And I'm not really good with math either. So, uh, it just doesn't jive for me. I hand sketch everything. Um, and I just keep, I go through a lot of erasers and I, I keep modifying. And then when I'm done, I, I try to, before I fall in love with it, I try to research as much as I can uh, on the internet and see if somebody's made something like it. 
because I don't I, w- I want my stuff to to speak to my design language obviously and and, and be unique to me but uh, I really don't want to mimic anybody else's work and there have been a couple of times that I thought I had a cool design I'll tell you right now just just a week ago I was designing this uh what I thought was a really badass tactical cleaver you know just for something different and cool not yeah. particularly useful or, or practical I should say but very cool and I was doing all these wild things on it and I was going to do this cool compound grind and everything else. And I texted the the sketch. I took a picture of the sketch and I texted it to Todd. And I said, hey, uh, for this ring guard that I want to do, I, I I need your help. I need a mill. I don't have a mill. Can I pop over one day? And he's like, he's like, yeah, absolutely, man. No worries. And then the next day, he's like, you know what's funny? He goes, uh, I just came across a picture of a Gil Hibben from like the uh-huh. 80s that looks really similar to that. I'm like. Well, crap on that. I'm not. <laughs> I, I deleted the picture, and that, that's going to be it. Um, I've had times where I've designed something, and then somebody on Instagram goes, "Hey, here's this new model I'm getting ready to make." And while it may not be the same, it's it's so reminiscent that I don't want to step on somebody's toes. So I even posted, "Hey, it's kind of similar to what I was going to do, but you you came out first, man. It is all yours. I'm going to trash mine." And and knife makers are really so awesome. You know, he replied back, "No, dude, do your take on. It. I want to." I'm like, "No, I'm not doing that." Because I, I don't want to cannibalize your work. And you know what? If if I fall in love with the one that I'm making, I don't want anybody else's out there like it either. So I want to be a little possessive myself. So it's either a knife that I've either 100% completely designed myself or something like like my Quaken. The Quaken, you know, it's a thousand-year-old design. You know? Right, right. I just put my spin on that that theme of knife, and I try to make it unique to me. To the, To that end, as an artist, it's... It is uh, it's always a struggle to fight being derivative because you're always looking at other people's work, whether whether it's classics, we'll call Hibben a classic right now. Sure. And uh, whether it's the classics or whether it's your peers, when you look at something, you take in and you really absorb the things that you like and tend to discard the things that you don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're always constantly fighting that instinct to to be derivative. And and if a design happens to incorporate all of the things that you like about another des- one other design that you've seen, well, that, that can make you uh, look like you're, you're copying, but that's a natural creative process. Um, years ago, I got up to visit, uh, when I still lived in Florida, I drove up to visit Frank Fisher. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we're over there with Stan Wilson. We're there with his dad, uh, Todd Fisher and, and Reese Whelan and having all kinds of fun. And Frank was like, dude, bring a whole bunch of knives. I, I kind of want to play in fondle with knives just to have some fun, you know, in between working. I'm like, cool. So I brought a case full of knives and I opened them up and we were, we were in his dad's shop. We were in Todd Fisher's shop. And Todd kind of looked over. I'm like, hey, come on over here to check out what I brought. He's like, no, that's OK. Hmm. He's like, I don't I don't really like to look at or touch or anything. Anybody else's knives, because I don't ever want to be accidentally influenced. If I wake up one day with a design idea. I don't want to discover a month later that it was because I had seen that bolster design on a knife three years ago on the internet or at a knife show. I, I don't want to be accidentally influenced. And that stuck with me. I remembered that. By the way, we did finally coax him into finally getting closer to the case. And out of over 30 knives, I mean, two, three, four, five thousand dollar knives, some of the best makers in the world out of every knife in there, the only one he couldn't critique and the only one that he actually said, I like. And he even put in his pocket and played with it was a Brad Southern. Really? Every knife, it was my Brad Southern Tarsus custom that, that he fell in love with. But again, here's the guy that's been doing it for so many years that he's going to be very jaded. He's going to have very strong opinions. And he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to look at a knife maker's knife and go, that knife sucks. That's not the kind of person he is. He's not a negative person. But when you be- begin making knives, you start recognizing the little cheats that are used to cover up little things here and there that a collector will never see, never notice. You see all these little things and you can pick them out a lot more quickly. It's one thing to be a collector and have an opinion on knives. You can't really have an opinion on knife making because you haven't done it. And my own videos, as they've evolved over the years, if you go back six years to my first videos, it was, hey, man, this is what I like about this knife and what I don't like. And then as I befriended knife makers and learned some of the process, I could speak a little bit more technically because I gained that knowledge from someone more knowledgeable than myself. And then now becoming a knife maker, my videos are a bit different because I'll break down a little more detail of how they did this or how this was achieved, 
what they had to decide upon before doing something, um, because I have that experience doing that now myself. So I would comment on the knives, not the knife making process. And now as I've, as I'm growing as a knife maker, and there's still so much more for me to learn, I can make commentary on the knife making process, given that it's something that I've had experience with. So are you more forgiving now, now that you understand how unforgiving the the actual making of a knife is? Um, are, are you more forgiving of what other makers do? Do you, do, you, do you know what I mean? Well, it's I wouldn't say it's quite that much. Here's the thing. I, I had to make basically make an announcement at one point um, that I had to start changing the way that I do videos. Um, there was a particular garbage knife that this, this poor guy was rubed into, actually two knives that he bought from this one maker. And they were fundamentally incorrect on every individual component and process in which the knives were made. I mean, everything was completely wrong. And that was evident physically in the knife itself? You can see it in the pictures without even holding okay. them. Um, and he wanted me to help him make the world aware because he had gotten ripped off. Mm, I remember this, yeah. So he sent the knives to me. And I stopped for a minute and went, well, I am now, I was just starting to become, I'm now a knife maker. And these are my peers, whether I like them or not, whether we're on the same level or different levels, it is in horribly bad taste to call out another knife maker's work. I mean, you just, you do not do that. That's a great way to get, uh, you know, make a lot of enemies really, really fast. Yeah. It's just something you don't do. Uh, whether you're on their level or not, they're better than you. They're worse than you. They've just made a one-time mistake. It's not your place because now you make knives. It's not your place to publicly critique another knife maker. Now, you get a bunch of knife makers in a room without the public, and you're going to hear all kinds of stuff about all kinds of people's work. But it's different when you're speaking to an audience that are potential customers right. for those knife makers. Now, this was such an egregious act upon the eyes, senses, and everything. Um, I sent the knives to someone else and they made a video about it and I separated myself, but it became known on this one group and people started blasting me. Oh, you're a sellout now. You're not going to tell us the truth anymore. You're not going to do this and that. And I said, well, yes and no. Here's the deal. If you see a knife on my YouTube channel now, I, I go through a lot of knives. People don't realize there's still a lot of knives that go through my hands. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that's so bad that would have to be critiqued rather heavily, I won't do it. I just won't make a video on it. That's, that's my choice to do so. So it's not that you can't trust what you see on my channel, because if I put something out there, it's because I love it. So right. yeah, you're going, now I'm always going to say, I would change this or that, or I'd like to see this or that, but I'm not going to put out something that I know is trash or needs a lot of adjustments or a lot of work because I don't want to, you know what? I've seen a lot of great knife makers' first knives. I've held Brad Southard's first knives. I've held Stan Wilson's first folder, first fixed blade. They, they were not where they are now back then, quite obviously. So I could be holding somebody's knife right now today, and it's terrible. But in five years, they're the next Todd Rexford. You don't know. So you don't want to discourage someone for one. You don't want to plant that seed of doubt in their mind. That's very unfair to their growth. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to damage their reputation because unless they're able to make and sell knives now, they can't afford to reinvest in materials and grow as a maker later. So they, they have to go through those steps. We all do. And I, I feel it's unfair to just pull that rug out from under someone and take that opportunity away from them. And on a more selfish uh, angle, you're also inviting in that kind of possibly unfair criticism, or at least that uh, that's an invitation to people to look at your work through a microscope and, and uh, comment sure. on you wherever you are in your process. You're not, yeah. you know, you're not Leonardo yet either. So, you know, trashing someone else is just inviting trash back in. You're absolutely correct. Yep. So knives are tools. Yes. I, I think a lot of people agree with that. I, I, I am also in the camp of uh, uh, knives or weapons. Hell, thank you. I'm so tired. I know. Listen, this whole thing of knives or tools, why, quite obviously, yes, they are. <laughs> but a lot of times, go just take it to, if you're carrying a karambit, that is not a tool. You are not using that for anything except for, that is a backup, you know, self-defense device. That is a weapon. That's why you're carrying that. If you're carrying 
uh, a spike that's that's built into a sharpie pen. That's not cool. <laughs> you know, you're not using that as a as a carpenter's mark. You're using that in case you have to stab some dude in the ear that won't get off of you. Yes, I I think that that there's a uh, maybe it's because people understand that if you uh, if you want to get to a certain level of uh, being able to fight with a knife, you you have to do some training. People don't do the training or don't want to. Um, I've been doing Kali for for a bit, and I love it. I've always loved knives, and and then when I done martial arts for a long time, and then when I discovered one that focused on knives, of course, it was a natural fit. Um, I understand that people might be reticent to accept knives as a weapon because they don't do the training, but there are a lot of aspersions cast broadly, um, mm -hmm. especially you know when I talk about knives as weapons. And what what's your take on that? I guess I just got your take on it. Do you carry knives as weapons as backups? I know you carry pistols, right? Absolutely. Listen, you know a lot of people ask. Why do you have a lanyard on a, a specific knife that you have? Why do you despise deep pocket clips, deep carry pocket clips? Because every knife, and why do you despise tip down carry? Every knife that I carry, no matter what it is, I look at as if my primary weapon were to fail or become disabled in some fashion, I want to have the knife in my pocket as an emergency backup. That is your oh shit backup. I don't like a deep carry pocket clip because it's harder to get that knife up and out of your pocket quickly and easily. I'm not 007. I don't need to deep conceal anything. Um, listen, when somebody looks at your pocket and they see a clip on, on the outside of it, no matter if it's a deep carry clip or not, it's a knife clip. People already know that you're carrying a knife. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, I don't like tip down carry because I don't want my, my hand position to change the time I've retrieve the knife from my pocket to opening it, how I'm holding it in my hand. I want it to be the exact same. I want it to index the same. Just like when I'm practicing with my pistols, I shot uh, Ipsic back in the days before IDPA was a thing. It's it's all about indexing. When you're doing your mag changes, you're indexing where that where how the, the orientation of that magazine is in your hand. Every little thing is about indexing. So I want to be able to index that knife as I'm pulling it out of my pocket. I want to know which direction the blade is facing. I want to know it when I open it, it's going to be in this position in my hand. Not because I'm a mall ninja, not because I think I'm going to get in a knife fight tomorrow, but because if something were to happen, listen, this is a different world. Most of my firearms training is from the 90s. Uh, back when we taught people, you know, when you're going to practice on the range, you're not even going to move the target beyond 21 feet because guess what? You shoot somebody at 60 yards, your life was not in imminent danger. You're going to go to jail. That's the way life was. Because what you were defending yourself against was the guy approaching you with a gas pump or the guy sneaking up behind you as you're leaving a restaurant, going to your car. Nowadays, it's it's a mass shooter scenario. It, it, it could be you are trapped in a shopping mall and you may have to take a 60 yard shot to prevent further loss of life. So every scenario has changed. So we train for different things these days. And for me, I look at it if if my primary weapon and even a secondary backup weapon has become incapacitated or is unavailable to me for some reason, I never leave my house without a pocket knife. My knife is always there, whether it's a, a folder or a fixed blade, or I carry both on many occasions. I want to know that I could possibly, do I want to rely on a three and a half inch blade to save my life? Absolutely not. It is not uh, the key choice for a, a, a weapons defense system. However, if somebody is on top of me, I am pinned down. I cannot access my gun. Something has happened, but I can reach up with that three and a half inch blade and, and, and cut an artery, or I can go in there and I can, I can do some damage otherwise in other parts of the body, which you are familiar with, with your colleague training. Um, I could take the butt end of it before I, if I can't even open it, I could take the butt end of it and I can I can manipulate a uh, pressure point just to get them off of me long enough to reach the primary weapon. There are so many reasons. So, yes, a knife fundamentally is a tool. I want something that I can cut open boxes with and do things with. However, the ones that I choose to carry personally are because it would suit me well uh, if I needed to use them in a self-defense situation. So how much should aesthetics go into the design of a knife then? I think I might know how you feel about this because you mentioned earlier, but you know, if, if this is a tool or if this is a weapon, how, how much um, should you be worried about how good it looks? It's like when I design a wrench or a hammer, which I don't, but if I were to, how much would I put into that? Sure. You're, you're, then you're getting into the, the form follows function uh, discussion. And, and there's a valid point for that. At the end of the day, it's like, you know what? 
let's look at guns again. You know, some of my favorite carry guns over the past almost 30 years now that I've been carrying have been Glocks. You know, they're they're not pretty. Uh, they're not going to win any beauty contests. But you know what? A lot of the Glocks that I've owned, I've modified and I've had Cerakote done. I've made it more aesthetically pleasing. So even though it's a workhorse, there's nothing wrong with making it, uh, number one, appeal to you visually, but number two, be a somewhat of a an outward indication of your individual personality. There, it's like, I love like World War II planes and the Flying Tiger motif. So I, I had my Glock 19 done in that Flying Tiger right. motif because I think it's cool. One of the things that I've, I've found uh, to become interested in throughout my lifetime. So it's an outward expression of my individual personality. It's who I am. The knives that I carry, yeah, they're going to be made of materials and done in a design that I like. I love recurves. I love tantos. I love timascus. Uh, I, there, there are certain things I love that will always be prevalent in my collection. But yeah, there's always going to be that. Is it, is, if it's not going to function for me on some fundamental level, uh, I'm probably not going to carry it. You know, I'll get rid of it. And the people say, well, you know, you say you carry every knife. You're full of shit. You've owned, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of knives. How can you say that? You can't carry every single knife. Well, no, that's true. The ones that I've gotten that I've tried to carry and went, "Eh, this just isn't me. I sold or I traded. I got rid of it. They're not in my collection. Mm -hmm. Every knife in my current collection, again, except for one for a very specific reason, I carry every knife that I own. The one and only knife that I do not carry is the, uh, the the one Michael Zeba that I that I have, the MS3, because for a few years he was contracted to do the finishing work on the Academy Awards, the Oscars. He oh, did wow. the finishing on the statues, and he made specifically for me one knife where all the titanium is in the Oscar gold. It's the real Oscar gold done in the same process. And it's like, if I carry it and scratch it up, I can't get it refinished. Yeah. So that's the only re I have other versions of that knife that I have carried, but that one I carried one day because for me, I have to at least carry a knife. I carried it the one day and I did baby it. <laughs> and it has sat in my case ever since because it can never be refinished. Yeah. It is very, very, very special. Just like you don't carry your Willem de Kooning painting to the office and say, check out my awesome painting here. Yeah, you you leave it at home under glass or whatever. I know uh, we've been talking for a while, so I'm going to have to wrap it up shortly. But I want to I want to know who who's your customer? Who is the Skelton Blade Works customer and what do they use your knives for? Um, first uh, and, and foremost, they, they should probably be drunk or high. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, about 80 percent of my sales go to repeat customers. So it's somebody that already owns my knives and and has a feel for what I've done that comes back and buy more and. and that to me speaks volumes. I'm so very, very, very thankful for those collectors. But I've noticed that I have people that come to me from various walks of life. The, the, the first knife I ever made and sold went to Bill Koenig, who's a knife maker. Uh, there are five or six of uh, Stan Wilson uh, asked me to make a scaphoid for him to deliver to him at Blade Show last year. That's so cool. That night, he posted a picture of him cutting his steak with my knife. That's Stan <laughs> freaking Wilson, man. Um, so I have several knife makers that own my knives. I have the collector that doesn't use their knife that collects my knives. I got a message. I'm sorry, the, the second knife I ever made and sold uh, that went to a cop here locally who still carries it every single day as part of his duty rig. That's pretty cool. I got an email a couple of weeks ago that I, I reposted on my Instagram um, from a, a great customer who he is also a police officer, but he took it out. He took his scaphoid out hunting. And he's like, I've had the great pleasure of cracking rib cages with this knife and addressing all these deer. And the knife is still as sharp as it was when I got it. So I've noticed that I have collectors and users and professionals from every walk of life. And it's astonishing to me that I've been able to appeal to a wide variety of people. I honestly thought as I began this, I'm only going to be able to sell to my my followers on Instagram or on my YouTube. And I've had people come to me from so many different walks of life. I have two chefs that I made chef knives for. Mm. Um, and it's it's been an incredible thing to 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 see that. To to look at your knives, they're so refined, so much care goes into their making that it's really cool to hear that police officers carry them daily on their on their belts because they're viewing it yes it's a thing of beauty but they're also viewing it as as a high quality tool so you're making at one time something that is beautiful and 
to be appreciated, but also has serious using, you know, you can really use it and put it to hard use. No, no cop is going to carry around dead weight on their, on their belt just because it looks pretty. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right about that. Uh, it, it's, it's a great compliment, especially at that stage in my career. I, it, it was my very first knife design of my own. It was the second knife that I had ever made. And uh, he's like, dude, I want that. And maybe it's just because I put blue liners under the carbon fiber. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but he was attracted to it. And um, it's, as far as I know, to this day, he still carries it. The last time I talked to him or, or, or saw a post from him was a few months back and it was still part of his duty rig. And I, I just thought that was pretty damn cool. So what are you aiming at with Skelton Blade Works? Where do you want to see uh, your company? I know you've told me where you want to go as a knife maker and as an artist, you want to pivot eventually into uh, fol- uh, folders as well. But for the company, what are we going to see uh, Skelton Blade Works, uh, cheap editions made in China? Are you <laughs> are you looking to blow up and get big? Are you looking to stay small and custom, something in between? Or are you just kind of taking each day as it comes? I I, I like the the romanticism of the starving artist theory. Uh, however, I also like to eat and feed my family. <laughs> so uh, I will continue to make my own handmade custom knives from bar stock you know, on my own every day. But I do have uh, right now four collaborations in the hopper. Um, most people already know Custom Knife Factory is going to be releasing a little finger flipper. So it'll be my first folder design. Um, that should be coming up hopefully somewhere around Blade Show. Not awesome. entirely. Yeah, it's a very com. I added a lot of complexity to it, changing it to a folder. Um, I have one other company that I will have um, a prototype at the Blade Show with me at my table. I don't want to announce the knife model yet, but uh, React Knives uh, came, oh. actually came to me, which was really cool because they turn away makers because they're so busy. And David, sure. you know what? I really like this one knife. Can we do something together? And I'm like, oh, my God, yes, I love React Knives. I love their quality. I love their consistency. So there's no way I would ever say no. I have an American company uh, that is a, I, 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 re- I retired my occipital, my number one, my first knife design. I retired that last year. And we're going to be making an affordable production USA made version. Uh, It's going to be coming out hopefully by Blade Show. And then I have one more that I don't want to talk too much about that uh, I'm also very, very excited about. So there's a lot of things in the hopper. And the reason for that is because you know what? It's if I cannot personally make a hundred knives in a month to get a windfall of money to reinvest in my business, I need a mill. I want a big, 2000 pound bridge port. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to do certain things before I make a folder. I'm going to have my mill. So to do that, one of these collaborations or two of these collaborations will allow me to afford to do that, allow my company to grow. So I will, and I want to be able to make something that is affordable. I get a lot of guys to go, man, I totally dig your knives, but I can't spend that kind of money for a handmade custom. Well, you know what? To be able to go out there for half or less than half and give somebody the same feeling. I'm very excited about being able to do that because that's not something that I personally can do for them. Mm. I I have to, you know, I can only make so many knives in a month. I know what my bills are. I know what my time is worth and I have to charge that amount of money. And to be able to put out a production collaboration is a pretty cool thing. And it, it, it speaks to the recognition that these companies have given me for the work that I've done. And I can't thank them enough because not that it's an ego boost, but that it's, to get that recognition, like just now recently being uh, accepted after passing a very grueling test period, just like everybody else, um, to be a part of the Knife Makers Guild. Yeah. It's, it's a feather in your cap. It's not an ego boost, but it's a feather in your cap to be able to say, I have accomplished this difficult task and I'm being recognized by people that actually do know what they're talking about. And it validates your self-worth, you know? Well, Yeah. Two things about that. Uh, one is uh, it's not necessarily the ego boost. It's when you love something and you love creating something and there are others out there who like it too. You want to be able to spread it as far and wide as possible. And, uh, you know, if you get an ego boost out of that, uh, all the better. But that's not I would imagine that's not why you're doing it. And I mentioned to you earlier, I like to wrap up with a knife story. This sounds like a perfect segue. Tell me about the the guild uh, recognition. This has actually been a, a longer process than most people realize. I just don't, I don't post everything all the time, but it was a couple of years ago that I turned in my first four inspection knives and I didn't expect to do so because I was so young in this industry. I would have never thought about it. 
And I was at the ICCE show in Kansas City and the president of the guild and, and uh, one of the directors said, hey, why didn't you bring any knives with you? Because like, I didn't think that my work, you know, was good enough. They, and the president, Gene, Gene Basket, said, I've held your knives. I think they're fantastic. And I, I'd love the chance to, to see what everybody else thinks. Well, my Kydex sheath maker is actually in Kansas City. Um, TJ at Crush City Custom Designs. We'll shout out for him. So I called him up and I just sent him like a dozen knives to have, make sheaths for. Mm-hmm. If you're not busy and you're fairly close, uh, would you mind grabbing four knives and just bringing them down here? He's like, hell yeah, man, let's do this. And he got all excited and he grabbed them and he was down there within the hour, I think. And I turned them in for inspection. So that means uh, four okay. knives and all four must be inspected by four different members of the guild to get your signatures, to turn in your application, to hopefully then possibly become a member of the guild. So all that worked out great. And I scored very highly, but I had a couple of notes. There were a couple of notes, work on this, work on that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Now this year, um, I spent a lot of time preparing myself for this inspection. And I made a whole bunch of knives, not just those four. I made a whole bunch of knives all at one time. And when I went in there, this is not an easy procedure. And these are not friends of mine. These are not people that I really even know. Mm-hmm. This is the technical committee. They judge everyone. And there's a checklist. They have a piece of paper. In front of everything is very formal. And you all go. we all go through the same process. Well, I turned in my four knives and you're asked to leave the room while they inspect them, which I wasn't expecting that part. I'm like, wow, I, I can't even be in the same room. My God, what's going to happen? When I came back, there were no notes. There was no feedback except for you've done exceptional work and we see the growth that you've made from where you were to where you are now. And that validated my my existence. My wanting to be in the guild was to is for that acceptance to be able to say, I have reached a certain level, albeit very early in my career, again, because of the leg up that I had from learning from good mentors and using good equipment and spending a lot of time practicing and trying to, to be as good as I could be, all that credit goes to other people and other things. And I'm so thankful to have gotten that opportunity. And I know there are people that have been trying to take shots at that for some unknown reason. I don't need to be judged by people that don't make knives. I was being judged by people that not only make knives, not only have made knives for decades, but their job within the guild is to inspect and scrutinize. They're there, whether you're going to get in or not. If even if you could even get in, but with notes, to come back and say, you need to work on this. You need to change this. This needs to be different. And I got none of that. I got, you did a damn good job and we can see the growth that you've made. And that was all I really needed. And that made me feel good. And in my mind, that helps every customer that's ever bought one of my knives Hmm. additionally validate the choice they made in purchasing something from me that I am working hard to grow and to better myself and to reach those landmark achievements. And no matter how anybody else views it, for me internally, it was a great deal of pressure and it was a great deal of relief. And it was a great source of pride for myself that I was able to pass those tests and to be sitting there among people that I've respected. I mean, I was, I was one of those kids that grew up on the Rambo knives and stuff. I was, I was, I was born in 74, so I'm a child of the 80s. And I grew up with the Predator and and with uh, Rambo and all that. And those knives were characters in the movies to me. Oh, absolutely. That VHS, and I would pause it. And I would I would look at Rambo's 13-inch blade, and i go, man, that is the coolest thing ever. And then I would save up for a year as as a, as a an early teen and buy the United Cutlery yes. knockoff that was in the, the back of the Sportsman's Guide, for those of you who remember that catalog. And to now sit in the same room with the same man that, um, you know, made like the Rambo three knife, you know, Gil Hibben, yeah. uh, former president of the guild to know that I have gone through the trials and tribulations that all of these other great men have gone through to get where I am. But that doesn't mean I've made it. That doesn't mean that I'm the best. That means that I have got my foot in the door and I now have an opportunity to learn from what, what are now my peers, these unbelievably talented makers and learn more and push myself harder to make better knives. And I hope that five years from now, I can look back on the knives that I make today and still be proud of them and still be glad that I did them, but go, wow, I, I really have changed a lot in my, my design theory or in my technical skill 
or in my my bravery in in risking a, a nearly done knife by adding some extra touch to it that could ruin it and I'd throw it away. I hope that I can look back and be proud of what I've done, but have seen a remarkable change from where I am now to where I am then. Well, congratulations, Jim Skelton. You are quite obviously on your way, and I think um, I think that's really admirable. People who uh, have to cast a sideways gl- sideways glance at that need to do a little self inspection. Need need to live their dream, you know. I don't really hate anybody, and I know that people listen. I have a, an online persona. I like to play a dick on the internet. It's fun. It really is. But most people know what that is. And anybody that has ever met me in person will tell you that's so not the same guy. So I don't hate anybody. Uh, you know, I wish them the best and hopefully they'll find something that makes them happy where they don't have time to tear down other people. Yeah. I generally just ignore it. The only time I don't ignore it is when everybody messages me. Did you see this? Did you see this? Yes, I saw it. And you know what? They've got an opinion just like everybody else. But you know what? At the end of the day, I'll censor myself for the sake of your audience, but there are <laughs> four F's. If you're not feeding me, financing me, effing me, or funding me, then your opinion of me does not matter. <laughs> Precisely, sir. You know, my paying customers matter. The people that uh, help me achieve my goals matter. The people whom I respect matter. And that's it. So you're spinning your wheels and you can say whatever you like to say. I go to bed every night content. My family is content. And that's what makes me content. And my customers are happy. And I walk out of my shop every day with the intention of trying something new and trying to be a little bit better. And that's that's all I can do as a person, man. So if people want to be negative about it, hey, man, go for it. That's on you. I'm going to remain positive and just try to grow. And I'll hit that wall one day and I'll find something that I cannot do. And then I'll realize where my limitations are. And you know what? I'm going to swim within those waters and enjoy that. Man's got to know his limitations, right? (laughs) So uh, this conversation has been inspirational to me, and uh, I think this summer will be a, a summer of, uh, I think I will get a heat treat oven this summer or Go something. Or, I, I, what I need is a better grinder, but I don't know. I, I just have to get back out in my in my shed, which is where I work right now, and uh, start pumping them out again. You, you've inspired me, sir. Just enjoy it. Wh- whatever happens, whether that thing is never going to be a, a saleable knife, just just that th- you enjoy doing it and you learn something from it, man, that's all that matters. I unfortunately jumped into the deep end. I went from learning how to make that very first knife to immediately going into being a full-time knife maker. Nobody really does that. Um, so I had a lot of pressure on me. If, if I could have kept a day job and done, done what you're doing, just do it for fun as a hobby. Oh my God, it's so much more fun. I would have had so much more <laughs> fun uh, because you don't, you don't worry about risking and throwing something away and I can't make uh, my, my rent or my car payment or something. If I don't finish this knife to completion, you had that freedom and it's so much more fun. Just enjoy it and share it with other people. That's that's what I tell you. Listen, do what you're doing and the enjoyment that you're getting out of it, somebody else will too. Share it with them and inspire them to do the same thing. So where can people find your knives online? I did close my books last year, um, so I don't take any direct orders. But uh, right now, I try to, as often as possible, make at least one knife available through my Instagram every month, whether it's auction. I just did two raffles this week just to have fun. But I have a whole dealer network. If you if you don't go to the Blade Show and you don't go to the Knife Makers Guild Show, those are the only two shows that I really do. You can I mean I'm I'm with uh, E Knives, Way of Knife, Carolina Custom, KG.com, Vienna Arsenal, Fort Henry Custom Knives, DLT Trading, the Hollow Grind Knife Center, the Urban Survivalist in Canada, Gear Barrel, and I'm making some right now for my first order with Blade HQ. Oh. I'm being represented by, in my opinion, some of the greatest purveyors on the internet. And uh, generally, they sell out when they arrive, thankfully. And uh, again, that's great. I really, truly cannot thank my customers enough for, for being as supportive as they are. So a lot of times when the knives land, they sell out instantly or they'll get messages before they arrive because I'll post, hey, these knives are going to you know DLT trading. And those start getting pummeled with messages. I want to buy that one before it arrives. Let me just pay for it now. Right. Um, A lot of what Fort Henry Custom Knives, what Vince has sold, he sold before he's ever put them on the website. So you guys are awesome. I truly love you guys and I appreciate the support. And I thoroughly recognize that I could not do what I'm doing and realize my dream without all of your support. And that means the world to me. 
Jim Skelton, thank you for taking so much time today speaking with me. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been an inspiration, and uh, uh, it's been great to get to know you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Follow The Knife Junkie on Instagram at thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram. Bob, just another great interview. I must admit, I really enjoyed listening to uh, Jim. Uh, a fascinating uh, kind of life story, if you will. A lot of, yeah. uh, lot of things he's done and uh, now uh, making it big in the knife world. From listening to this, uh, well, from having this interview with Jim, it was uh, really inspirational. And it left me feeling like, you know, work hard, uh, follow your dreams, forget the haters, and just uh, go where your passion takes you. But be sensible about it. And I think that's what he's right. doing. And I think he's making a hell of a, a career in knives. And get back in that shed, Bob, and start making those knives. Back to the shed. So, Bob, uh, as we kind of wrap up this little longer podcast, but I think well worth listening, final thoughts from The Knife Junkie. I just wanted to voice my appreciation for everyone who tunes into The Knife Junkie podcast. It's uh, It's been great so far, and it's humbling to, to see the positive reaction we're getting. So thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, I promise we'll keep cranking out some awesome content. What do you say, Jim? Sounds like a plan to me, Bob. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.